Welcome to our study of the book of Hebrews. This is a work of the Metaview Church of Christ in Mesquite, Texas. Today we will be discussing the topic of instrumental music from Hebrews 13, 15. And now here is Mike Heisall with today's lesson. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible study this evening. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Hebrews chapter 13. In just a moment, uh, we'll begin our study there. Uh, but while you're turning there, uh, I do want to make one announcement. Um, you may have already seen the MVCC email that went out earlier today, but if you haven't, uh, I need to let you know this. The elders have decided that MetaView will begin meeting together again on Sunday, May 17th. And so for the next two Sundays, that is May 3rd and May 10th, we'll continue uh, using an online format. But beginning May 17th, uh, MetaView will begin to worship together again, that is during the worship hour. And during this period of time, uh, we'll also continue to post our uh, Wednesday Bible studies on the YouTube channel. So last week we studied Hebrews chapter uh, 13 verses 7 through 16. And uh, when we were noticing verse 15 from that passage, I said that uh, this verse is one of the reasons why churches of Christ uh, worship God with a cappella singing without the accompaniment of instruments of music. And so today what I would like to do is spend a little bit more time on that thought. I want us to um, ask in a little bit more detail why churches of Christ worship a cappella without instruments. And I also want us to consider uh, some of the arguments that are often used by people who say that worshiping God with instruments of music are okay. Now, my reason for uh, slowing down a little bit and camping out at Hebrews 13, 15 is twofold. Uh, one reason is because I'm trying to buy a little bit of time. Uh, there's not much left in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to begin studying the book of Daniel after we finish Hebrews, Lord willing, and so it would be better for us to uh, not begin Daniel online and then move to you know continuing studying it in person. It would be better just to wait until we're all together and then start studying the book of Daniel. So I'm trying to buy just a little bit of time. But really the main reason why I want us to spend some time uh, this evening uh, studying the question of why a cappella is uh, because uh, churches of Christ in today's religious environment are relatively uh, unique. Most churches worship with instruments. And so whenever a visitor comes uh, to our services and uh, experiences our musical worship, uh, they often scratch their head and wonder, well, where are the instruments? But further, uh, in recent decades in Churches of Christ, there really has not been as much teaching on why we do what we do musically. And I think an upshot of that is the fact that fewer and fewer members of Churches of Christ really have a conviction that um, worship in the church should be a cappella. More and more members of the church feel uh, just as comfortable worshiping with instruments as what they do worshiping a cappella. And, you know, they may feel that worshiping a cappella is a good and a useful tradition, but they don't think that it's a matter of right or wrong. And so uh, this study is one that I think we need to engage in more often as opposed to less often. Now, before we turn to the biblical text, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I grew up in Baptist churches. Um, I went to uh, churches that belonged to two different Baptist denominations. During my earliest years, I went to general Baptist churches, and once I got into late middle school and into high school, my membership was at a Southern Baptist church. And uh, in those churches, as you would expect, worship was done with instruments. And especially in the Southern Baptist church that I attended, we had all sorts of instruments. 
not just pianos and organs, but we had guitars and we had drums and we had stringed instruments like you would see in an orchestra and all sorts of musical presentations. And so I well remember how I felt the first time that I went to a worship service of Churches of Christ. My chemistry teacher invited me to the Bloomfield Church of Christ on May 24th, 1996. And the Bloomfield Church of Christ uh, worshipped in a very small white frame building. And I remember walking in the doors, and when you walked in, you were immediately facing the pulpit. Uh, not much of a foyer in that little church building. And uh, as I walked in and I looked up to the pulpit and I noticed there were no pianos or organs, no instruments of any kind, I scratched my head and wondered what was going on. And then the singing started and there were no instruments. And so that, this was one of the first questions that I asked my chemistry teacher as we ate pizza together at a little local restaurant after the worship service. I, I said, why? Do you worship without instruments? Now, you know, again, if all we've known is, uh, you know, 20th and 21st century American churches, churches of Christ seem to be strange because nearly everybody else uses instruments of music. But here's something that Dr. Everett Ferguson observed. If you're not familiar with that name, uh, Brother Ferguson uh, taught church history at Abilene Christian University for years up until his retirement. And, and Brother Ferguson is considered to be one of the world's leading experts on the history of early Christians. In fact, when Zondervan, uh, the uh, Christian uh, publishing company, uh, was going to make a uh, church history textbook, one of the people that they tapped on the shoulders uh, to help with this project was Everett Ferguson. Brother Ferguson wrote the first volume in that two-volume set. He wrote uh, a history of the church for the first, as I recall, seven centuries. But Brother Ferguson made this comment uh, concerning a cappella singing in church. He said, it is easily the majority practice in the history of the church. Now, you know, of course, obviously, we, we see from Brother Ferguson's credentials that he is in a position to know what he's talking about. And, and so why? Why is it the case that the majority of those who have worn the name Christian through the centuries have worshipped God a cappella? Why do we in Churches of Christ worship a cappella? Well, let me just briefly give you the argument. Before we look at a passage of Scripture, here's the basic argument. The argument has basically two, two pieces to it. In the first place, it's our conviction that uh, the worship that God accepts is worship that is done according to God's instructions. So that's the first step. The worship that God accepts is the worship that is done according to God's instructions. The second uh, part of the argument is that God's instructions to His New Testament church authorize only singing. They do not authorize instruments of music. So, just simply, that's the argument. Now, let's notice it from the book of Hebrews, and then we'll notice it from other passages as well. Now, last week, we read Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. But you remember we pointed out that that passage is a part of a larger context. And we noted back in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Now, a couple of things to notice there. We are to worship God acceptably. Implied in that statement is that someone could worship God in an unacceptable way. 
So how do we worship God acceptably? The way to worship God in, in a way that He will accept is to worship Him with reverence and awe. And you remember what we uh, discussed the meaning of reverence is. This word reverence occurs two times in the New Testament, two times in the book of Hebrews. And the earlier occurrence of it was back in Hebrews chapter 5, relative to Jesus, where we're told in the Garden of Gethsemane, Hebrews 5, 7, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And so as Jesus pleaded with the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, he not only sweated blood, but he also shed tears. And, and the Hebrews writer goes on to say that Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. Now, the words that the uh, NIV translates reverent submission in Hebrews 5.7 in Greek is the same as the one translated reverence in Hebrews 12.28. And so, so why was Jesus heard? Why were his prayers heard? Why did God raise Jesus from the dead? It's because Jesus had reverent submission. And you remember what he prayed in the garden? He said, Father, remove this cup from me. Not my will, your will be done. Jesus had a reverent submission. He was willing to comply to the Father's instructions. In fact, the very next verse of Hebrews 5 says, Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Now that is the way that Frederick William Danker, he's deceased now, but uh, he died just a few years ago, but he was the world's leading lexicographer uh, for uh, the words used in the Greek New Testament. That's the way that Frederick William Danker uh, in his lexicon, defined this word that's translated reverence in Hebrews 12.28. It's reverent submission. It's compliance. And so how do we worship God acceptably? We worship God acceptably by complying with His instructions for worship, by submitting ourselves to what He commanded us to do. A parallel is Jesus' statement in John 4, 24, when he says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship God in spirit? Well, I don't have time to argue it fully, but I believe it means to worship God with our spirit, worship God with our heart. Our minds have to be engaged. We have to mean the things that we do in worship. What does it mean to worship God in truth? Well, Jesus defines what that means. In John 17, 17, Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so to worship God in truth means we worship God according to his instructions. And you see, in the Bible, we have examples of people who worship God according to their own likes, and they offered God worship that he did not accept. You might consider, for instance, Matthew chapter 15, where the Pharisees are judging Jesus' disciples for not following their traditions. And Jesus quotes a passage from Isaiah to them, and he says, this is true of you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, they worship me in vain. Now, what does it mean to worship God in vain? It means one offers God worship which he does not accept. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And so whenever we offer God worship that we've thought up, that's worship that God doesn't accept. Uh, think about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Uh, they went in to worship God with their censers, and they put incense in their censers, but they got fire, the NIV says, was unauthorized fire. And they burned their incense with unauthorized fire, fire that was not according to God's instructions. And the Bible says that God was not pleased with their worship. Rather, God sent fire and consumed them. And so that's the first part of our argument. To worship God acceptably, 
We have to worship him according to his rules, according to his instructions. You know, keep in mind, the text says that we worship God. Whenever we come to worship, our goal, our main goal, should not be getting goosebumps ourselves. Our main goal should not be doing things that entertain us. Our main goal should be presenting to God praise that He accepts, praise that pleases Him. Okay, so so that's the first part of the argument. Uh, Worship that God accepts is worship that is according to God's instructions. So the second part of the argument is simply that the New Testament only authorizes singing. So we look again at Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips, that openly profess His name. Now, whatever is being described in this passage is verbal, right? The sacrifice of praise that's offered to God in this passage is verbal because it's described as being the fruit of lips. Now, as I said last week, I don't think that this passage is exclusively talking about singing. There are other things that we do that uh, would qualify uh, according to this verse. Prayer could certainly be considered a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips. Um, Other verbal exclamations of God's excellencies uh, could qualify as a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips. But certainly, singing praises to God would qualify as the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips. And I believe that a part of this context is certainly the assembled uh, worship gatherings of the church. And I say that on the basis of Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19, The Hebrews writer uh, encourages us on the basis of Jesus' high priestly activities to draw near to the most holy place, to come into God's presence and to worship Him. And in that context, he says in verses 24 and 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And by the way, the fact that it says some are in the habit of doing it would would show that the Hebrews writer is not just uh, saying that one shouldn't apostatize and totally abandon the worship services of the church, but it also says that one shouldn't miss single worship services of the church, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So in this context, the assembled worship uh, uh, of the church is in view. And, and so, so that's why I would say that Hebrews 13, 15 would, would talk then about our singing when we come together. And there it's just verbal. But this isn't the only place that uh, the singing of the church uh, comes into view. You might consider 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is the longest passage to address what may and may not be done in the church assembly. And in Hebrews 14, in verse 15, uh, the Hebrews, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse, we've been studying Hebrews for so long, I just got Hebrews on the brain. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, the Apostle Paul said this, So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Now, I think that it's interesting that the Apostle Paul in this context twice will use instruments for illustrative purposes, but whenever he talks about what the church does musically when it comes together, he says the church sings. In Ephesians chapter 5, we have another reference to the uh, singing that's done in the assembly of the church. Ephesians 5 and verse 19 says, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Now some people say, well, the context of that is the individual Christian life. The context of that is not the assembled 
uh, worship gathering of the church. But I would say a couple of things in response to that. First of all, uh, the book of Ephesians was read in the assembly of the church. So when Ephesians was first heard, it's when the church was assembled together. Now as the church is assembled together, and as Ephesians 5.19 is read, and they hear these words, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. How would they hear that? Uh, th they would hear that with reference to what they were doing. You see, Ephesians 5.19 is not something that I can do by myself when I'm mowing the yard. Ephesians 5.19 requires that there be at least another person present with me because uh, I I, we're to be speaking to one another. And so when that was first heard, they heard that as being a reference to the assembly uh, and the worship that's done in the assembly. And there, all that's authorized is singing. Another passage, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. It's a parallel to Ephesians 5.19. Here the Apostle Paul says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Again, only singing. Well, again, some say, well, no. Um, the context of that is the individual Christian life. It's not the assembled worship of the church. And I would say much the same thing that I said relative to Ephesians. You know, Colossians 4.16 says that Colossians was to be read in the assembly of the church. How would they hear that? And I would add, additionally, to what I said concerning Ephesians, Colossians 3.15, the verse that immediately precedes verse 16, says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Now, did you notice that? Before Paul says that uh, the message of Christ is to dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns, etc., he says you were called together in one body. And what is the one body according to Paul's definition in Colossians? Colossians 1.18 says the one body is the church. So the context of this is the assembly of the church. And so, long story short, all that the New Testament authorizes for the worship of the church is singing. Now, you may be inclined to say, well, what about Revelation? In the book of Revelation, we read about instruments being used in worship that's done in heaven. Think about a passage like Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, where around God's throne we're told, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And so you have evidence of instruments being used in heavenly worship, and so wouldn't the early church have gotten a cue from that and used uh, instruments in church worship? Well, I would say a couple of things. You know, first of all, we need to be very careful in how we interpret Revelation. Do you really think there are literal harps in heaven? Do you really think there's a literal street of gold in heaven? You know, further, I would say, if you argue that something ought to be in the church just because it's in heaven, be careful because you may end up with some things in the church that shouldn't be there. You know, keep in mind, there aren't just harps described in Revelation as being in heaven. There are also altars. Do we want to bring altars into the church? You know, sacrificial altars? Do we want to bring incense altars into the church? Uh, there are thrones in heaven. Do we want to bring thrones into the church? Just because something is described as being in heaven in the book of Revelation doesn't mean that we want to bring it into the church. Let me give you this quote also. This is from the uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It's a, a massive uh, work, uh, multiple volumes. And from volume 8 of the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which it just goes and it uh, defines uh, some words that are used in the Greek New Testament and gives their background and that sort of thing. Uh, Gerhard Delling, 
uh, says this concerning the instruments in heaven. He says, quote, and, and Gerhard Delling is not a member of Churches of Christ, the reference to stringed instruments in heavenly worship at Revelation 5.8 and 15.2 need not mean that such instruments might sometimes accompany the singing at primitive Christian worship. In fact, when we look into church history, it is so abundantly clear that no instruments were commonly used in the worship of the church for the first 1,000 years. Let me read you a, um, a quote from uh, a bishop in what would be modern-day Serbia. And he wrote this um, either at the end of the 4th century or beginning of the 5th century. Uh, and here's what he said. It's in a work uh, that's entitled On the Utility of Hymn Singing. He wrote, quote, it is time to turn to the New Testament to confirm what is said in the Old and, particularly, to point out that the office of psalmody, so singing, is not to be considered abolished merely because many other observances of the Old Law have fallen into desuetude. Only the corporal institutions have been rejected, like circumcision, the Sabbath, sacrifices, discrimination in foods, so too the trumpets, harps, cymbals, and timbrels. For the sound of these, we now have a better substitute in the music from the mouths of men. The daily ablutions, the new moon observances, the careful inspection of leprosy are completely past and gone, along with whatever else was necessary uh, only for time, as it were, for children. Of course, what was spiritual in the Old Testament, for example, faith, piety, prayer, fasting, patience, chastity, psalm singing, all this has been increased in the New Testament rather than diminished. And so this is just one of multiple quotations could, that could be given from uh, early Christian writers to show that they only sang, and not only was it the case that they only sang, but they were opposed to instruments of music. And this opposition to instrumental music continued for centuries. In fact, let me uh, give you a quote from Thomas Aquinas. This is from uh, his work that he wrote in about 1250. Now here's what he said, 1250, quote, Further in the old law, God was praised with musical instruments and musical song, according to Psalm 32, 2-3, Give praise to the Lord on the harp. Sing to him with the psaltery, the instrument of Tim strings, Sing to him a new canticle. But the church does not make use of musical instruments, such as harps and psalteries, in the divine praises for fear of seeming to imitate the Jews. And so you see, for well over a thousand years, the church only sang. The church did not use instruments of music. This is the conclusion of a number of church historians. Uh, Church historians who have no connection with Churches of Christ. Consider, for instance, what John Gerardo, who's a Presbyterian minister, and he was a professor at uh, Columbia Theological Seminary in South Carolina. Here's what he wrote in his book, Instrumental Music in the Public Worship of the Church. He wrote, quote, There is no evidence but the contrary to show that instrumental music was commonly introduced into the church until the 13th century. John Gerardo was very much an advocate for a cappella singing. Here's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says in an article entitled Musical Instruments in Church Services, quote, For almost a thousand years, Gregorian chant without any instrumental or harmonic addition was the only music used in connection with the liturgy. And so I would say that our interpretation of the New Testament is confirmed by church history. Well, this may lead us to ask a question. You know, is it important? Why might it be the case that God has only directed the church to worship Him uh, in song without instruments of music? And, you know, we don't have a verse of Scripture that just explicitly says, here's the reason why sing, and here's the reason why you should not use instruments of music. Uh, that, that, that verse is not there. But when we 
notice the reason for why God allows certain other things in worship and disallows certain other things in worship, uh, I, think that, I think that if we'll uh, give some thought to that consideration, we can have some light shed on you know, perhaps the why of uh, God's authorizing singing and prohibiting instruments. Consider, for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We were there just a few moments ago, but, but let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul um, gives some instructions concerning the use of spiritual gifts in the church. And uh, it seems like there was just a plethora of tongue speaking in the Corinthian church assemblies. You know, people were speaking in languages they'd never studied, languages that no one else in the assembly knew, and they were speaking in these languages without an interpreter. And it sounds like it was chaos. And the Apostle Paul lays down the rule, well, listen, tongue speaking can go on in the assembly. However, the only way someone is allowed to speak in a tongue is if there's an interpreter present. And the interpreter has to... Uh, make clear to the congregation in a language they understand what was said in a language that they don't understand so that they can receive edification. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, What then shall I say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Uh, what the NIV translates as built up could be translated edified. And what, what is the meaning of edification in the context of 1 Corinthians 14? Well, I don't have time to uh, build the argument in detail. But the idea of edification in 1 Corinthians 14 is instructed. The way that the church is edified is that the church is instructed in words that they understand and they're strengthened in the Christian faith. They're built up in the Christian faith. Now, now keep this in mind. If edification just meant goosebumps, if edification just meant the service is stimulating and entertaining and makes you feel that God's at work, then Paul would have had absolutely no reason to forbid multiple people from speaking in tongues even with no interpreter present. But Paul says, listen, you may only speak in tongues when there is an interpreter present so that the church can be edified. And so edification is not entertainment, edification is instruction. And then we get to thinking about um, our music. And you know, the primary uh, direction of our singing is upward. We're singing to God, we're praising God. But a secondary benefit the New Testament tells us of our singing is we're singing uh, horizontally. We're singing to one another. And you look at what Paul said again, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 or 16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And here's the thing. My words can teach and admonish you. Your words can teach and admonish me. But the sound of instruments of music playing can't teach and admonish us. They can't edify us. They can give us goosebumps. They can entertain us. They can stimulate us. But they cannot do what Paul said is a qualification for an act to be legitimate in the assembly. 1 Corinthians 14, they can't edify us. They can't build us up in the Christian faith. And so, so briefly, uh, my brothers and sisters, this is the New Testament case for a cappella singing. Now, there's so much more that could be said, so many more details that could be given, but this is the case. So let's go ahead and end our study at this point, and next week we'll consider some of the arguments that are used to try to justify instruments of music, and we'll consider whether or not they're valid. And so I look forward to having that time with you. God bless. We thank you for taking the time to study the Bible with us. We pray that this has been an edifying experience and that you would join us again. If at any point during the Bible study you had some questions, please feel free to email us at mhysaw at meadowview.org. The email is both on the screen and in the description.
It is our goal to answer every Bible question with a Bible answer, to speak where the Bible speaks, and to be silent where it is silent. God bless you. We love you.